I pray that we would learn to hear the breath of heaven. Father, that we would learn to see your hand guiding us. And Father, I pray that as we go through this Christmas season, that we wouldn't play with the cardboard box, but that we would focus on the greatest gift ever given. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you came in this morning, um, hopefully you got one of these. And uh, if you look at these, you may go, wow, that looks really, really well done. Um, And you may think that looks really expensive. Well, I will tell you, um, it was really well done, um, but it wasn't expensive. Uh, Ryan um, actually designed the cover the outside of it, and uh, our secretaries, uh, Paula and Tanya, took care of the inside. Um, But what I want you to notice about it, if you look at this just by itself, you will notice that there is nothing on this that says today. There's a reason for that. What we're going to ask you to do, today you can keep it if you would like to. But after this Sunday, what we're going to ask you to do is when we finish the worship service, as you walk out these doors, there will be, right as you go out, there's going to be a little table and it's going to have a basket. We're going to ask you to take those bulletins and just drop the bulletin in the basket. Why are we going to do that? Because we're going to reuse them. It is an issue of stewardship. Um, Stewardship in a number of areas. One, a stewardship of our finances. We can have a really nice, high-quality bulletin that looks really good for a cost that is a lot less. But there's another reason. It's stewardship of environmental resources. And you may go, oh my goodness, we've got a liberal up here. (laughs) I want to tell you something. You read the Genesis account of creation, it tells us that we are given, begin given a responsibility by God to manage and steward the resources of the earth. One of the ways that we can do that is simply by doing this, just recycling these bulletins. Now, what we do, you'll put them in there. When we have a group that comes in on Friday, they restuff them, and uh, they will just take the bulletins. When the one gets crinkled up and starts to look bad, They're going to throw it away, okay? We'll recycle those. But until then, we're going to just continue to use them. The only thing that will change is what comes inside of the bulletin. Uh, You notice today that uh, there's some things that are inside there. Um, And I will say this. The one little sheet that says yes and no on it, some of you may be wondering, what on earth is that about? Don't worry. But if at the end of the service we have not done something with that, somebody yell at me and say, Grant, you can't end the service yet, okay? Um, Because we got to use that. It'll be the very, very end of the service. Um, So if you see that, you know, just say, whoa, Grant, you can't stop yet. Um, But again, as you walk out this morning, if you want, just drop those into the, um, into the little basket there, and they will be reused. And again, I want to say thank you to Ryan and uh, Paula and Tanya that did the work on those. Uh, They did a great job. One other thing before I start. Usually when a pastor or staff member begins to read a letter to the church during a worship service, it portends bad or at least at the best sad news. Today, this letter only brings good news. I'm excited to announce the return, and I know that sounds funny, the return of Andy Pickens as our long-term interim worship leader. He's not really returning. Um, We're just kind of formalizing the fact that he is going to stick around for a while. Um, He will remain the interim for the present because it is all of our desire to allow God to lead us on this journey of growth and change. We don't know the specifics of how or where the Lord will lead us in the days ahead, but we definitely want to walk with Him each step of the way. We will not, I want to repeat that, we will not be conducting a search for a permanent music minister at this time. Let me explain our plan. Andy will continue leading the music portion of our worship services. He will begin working with a sanctuary choir on rehearsals. As we move into the dual Sunday school schedule next Easter, Andy will lead all three worship services, rehearse the sanctuary choir, and the worship team band. After two months of that dual Sunday school schedule, the pastoral staff will sit down together to discuss how the system is working and to evaluate our next steps. Andy staying on in the capacity of worship leader, and you notice we call him worship leader, not music minister, because when I say music minister, most of you have a specific idea of exactly what that is, and Andy's not going to handle all of that. Okay, He's got a very defined, very limited role. Um, Him staying on a capacity of worship leader will allow First Baptist to meet the current needs related to music and worship leadership while at the same time giving us flexibility to meet upcoming needs. 
John, Ryan, and myself, along with the entire personnel committee, are excited to work with Andy to meet the music, the worship music needs of First Baptist. We do recognize this plan will not meet all of our wants in regard to music, but as stated, it meets our needs while allowing us flexibility to meet future needs. And so I want to say thank you to Andy for him being willing to continue with us. He's done a great job, and uh, we look forward to serving with you and in the future seeing what we do with that interim tag. Amen. Amen. I, want to, I want you to watch a very short video, and I'll just stay up here while this video plays. <laughs> You may have wondered as you came in. Actually, I've had to I've had to keep about three or four people from removing my box this morning. Even before the 8:30 service, David Miller comes up, and I can see it's just killing him. And he comes up here, and he's and he's walking by, and it's like he's trying to sneak by and pick it up. And I was like, no. Um, you may remember last Sunday I talked a little bit about my cousin Ryan when he was about three years old and the Christmas present that my sister, not his mom, but my other sister, Tanya, had bought. Uh, she had bought the hottest toy of the year, and it was expensive. Uh, you know, if you knew my sister, she was not married, lived with mom or with, Aunt Sa- with Sandra, and she had money. She didn't have to spend money on housing, and so she had money, and she loved to spoil her niece and her nephew. Well, well, at this point, it was just my nephew, so she had a lot of money. So she had spent all this money. And so Ryan goes in, he pulls everything out, and he pulls out this toy. And I mean, it was. It was the hottest toy of the year. Every kid was just dying to get this toy. He pulls it out, he sets it aside, and he starts playing with the box. And, and the funniest thing, we had a video of it because Tanya was so convinced that Ryan was going to love this present, that she had the video camera set up, she had it turned on, and she had it running. And, and what, was, what was really funny is I've seen that video, and I wish I could find it, because it's classic. Because somebody realized after a little bit of Ryan playing with the box, they realized that Tanya was getting really mad. <laughs> and so they went from Ryan playing with a box, they began to video her. And you could just, I mean, if literally steam was like coming out of her ears, she was, oh, she was so mad. She was so mad she threatened to take the present back. You know, the, we'll make sure you understand, I am not saying that Jesus is a toy that we play with. But how many times in life do you and I play with a cardboard box when we have the greatest gift that's been given to us? If you've got a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read, begin reading in verse 8, and I'm not going to read the whole story, but just a little bit of it. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flocks. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. You know, this, uh, this passage of Scripture, talking about the shepherds, before we really dive into it, we've got to sit and talk about what shepherds were. I think sometimes we have this picture of shepherds that doesn't really capture the reality of what they were. Because we think of shepherds, we, we have this almost idyllic picture of this really nice guy who wanders through the fields and, you know, has this little, rings his little bell so the sheep will come with them. And, and we have this picture of, these, of a shepherd as, as just these idyllic, sweet, nice men. The reality was far different in Jesus' day. Because you see, shepherds had to be tough. Remember what David says before he fights Goliath? He says, you come to me with, with things. He said, but I have killed the lions and have killed the bears that came to attack my sheep. 
A shepherd had to be a tough man. Had to be a strong, a ferocious man because a shepherd, they had to be able to protect the sheep from those that wanted to take them and to kill the sheep. But he also had to be able to defend the sheep from those that wanted to come and steal. So they had to be able to, to defend it from wild animals, but also from other men that might have wanted to come and steal the sheep. And so the shepherd is not just this mild, meek, wimpy guy. Shepherds are tough. I mean, they're manly men. You know, they're, they're the kind of men that, that you look up to when you're a kid because they look tough. They can handle themselves. It wasn't tell us that when the, when the angels came, first it says that the shepherds, that the night exploded with sight and sound. Can you imagine that? Sitting out there on a, on a nice night, and then all of a sudden, the skies just seem to explode in light. And it says that they saw the angels and that they were terrified. I want to tell you that, that word that they were terrified, I think it says something to us about what angels are. Popular culture portrays angels, again, as these little sweet things. You know, you, if you came in the doors over here this morning, you saw the big Christmas tree. If you look up way up on the very top of that, there's an angel. And the angel is sweet looking. It's angelic. We've got that term angelic. Would you be terrified of something like that? No. None of us would be terrified of something like that. But all throughout the Scriptures, when you see a person encounter an angel, the reaction is always the same. They go face down on the floor, terrified. They're struck with fear. Why is that? I think it's because the angels themselves were terrifying. Not terrifying in an ugly sense, but they were terrifying in the sense of their majesty, of their power, of their strength that just exudes out of them. People would see the angels and they would say, man, this is somebody that could do serious damage to me. But the angels were power. And so the, the shepherds see them and the shepherds are terrified and they fall on their face and they're scared. But the angels don't lead, let them stay there. They say, don't worry, it's a good day. Because today we bring you good news of great joy. That word great joy, it goes beyond mere personal feelings. Uh, this joy goes beyond anything that we can conjure up for ourselves. Uh, it's a joy that goes beyond the ages. It's a joy that goes beyond anything that you and I can understand. It is not something that we can do for ourselves, but it is something that is given to us, and it is a choice that we make to accept that. And the, the, the shepherds who were, see, were there, the angel says, I have good news of great joy. And they have to decide, are we going to take this or not? And that great joy was that today, in the city of David, Bethlehem, that the Messiah has been born. And so the angel of the shepherds rise up from where they were, and it says that they run into town. They run into town to find the Messiah. They began to realize that Joy, happiness, doesn't come in the way that they had expected. Over this season, you're going to be bombarded with advertisements. Advertisements saying that, that if for your little kids, that you've got to get this toy, because this toy is going to make Christmas. For us adults, you know, you'll see the car advertisements. Zero down. Zero interest. Pay it out over 20 years. <laughs> and, and that if you really want to have the best Christmas, get your wife a brand new car. Because boy, you get her a brand new car and she is just going to be so happy and everything is going to be perfect. 
Because she's going to wake up on Christmas Day and she's going to walk out and there is that car going to be sitting there with the bow on top on Christmas Day and, and everything will be perfect. It's the commercialism of Christmas. We have got to learn to counteract that commercialism of Christmas. Do not buy into that, that myth that if you just get the perfect present or, or, or the perfect gift for your wife or for your kids, that it's going to make Christmas perfect. As parents, we know we can't do that. So how do we go about counteracting the commercialism of Christmas? One, last Sunday I gave you a challenge to go do something this Christmas season for somebody else. To take a plate of cookies. Um, to, to take some hot chocolate. To do something. To give to somebody around you. Just to give away the gift of Christmas. We've talked about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It's a great way to give. The, uh, the, stock, the deals for the um, God's Table. To take one of those cards and to buy the presents for somebody who is less fortunate. Somebody does not, could not and can't do it for themselves. Those are great ways. Learning to give instead of focusing on receiving. But I want to give you one more. If you notice on, the, on your outline here, it says, Join us at the Sanger Christmas Parade. Now, I'm not telling you to go to a parade so that you can watch the pretty floats. I am sure there's going to be some great, beautiful floats that are going to be in this parade. That's not why I'm telling you to go to the Christmas parade. I'm going to tell you to go to the Christmas parade to serve. Come to the Christmas parade. We are going to be there, I believe, at 6 o'clock. We're going to have hot chocolate, and we're going to be doing Christmas carols. And so what I want to encourage you to do, I want to challenge you to do this week, is to come to the Christmas parade at 6. Be there ready to sing carols with us and to hand out hot chocolate. Take an hour out of your time to give to others. Take an hour to, to do for somebody else so that they might have some fun. They might have some enjoyment. And do it in the name of Christ. So I want to challenge you. If you were not planning to go to the Christmas parade, make it a commitment. Come. Be there at 6. Sing with us. And you may go, Grant, you don't want to hear me sing. You don't sing any worse than I do. I promise. Okay? And I'll sing. I'm not going to sing a solo, Andy. <laughs> but come and sing. And then help us pass out hot chocolate. And I guarantee you, every one of us can help pass out hot chocolate. There, there's not any one of you here, I don't think. Because even if you can't move, you can sit by the hot chocolate, the cooler, or whatever we have it in. You can sit by it and push the button for them. Okay? We can all do that. So I want to challenge you... Make it an effort to come and to serve. Bring your kids. And I don't care how old your kids are. Bring them. Bring your two-year-old, your three-year-old. And yes, I know you will not be nearly as effective in helping to pass out hot chocolate if you're having to chase your two-year-old. I understand that. But here's what's going to happen. Your two-year-old is going to see you doing something for other people. And not this time, it's not going to click in their brain that, oh, I should do for others. But you do it this time, and you do it another time. And over the experience of their life, they begin to understand that the best way to live is to do for other people. It becomes just part of their life. So bring your kids. Come and be a part of this. That is the way that we counteract the commercialism of Christmas. I'm not telling you to not go out and buy presents. I'm not saying that we should just no presents this year. I tried it one time. I nearly got killed for it. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But counteract it. Focus on the gift of Christ instead of all the gifts of Christmas. How do we experience it? Well, only Jesus can bring real joy. He is the only one. Nobody else and nothing else. In Disneyland... Disney has this deal that Disneyland is the happiest place on earth. And I think you're going to see a picture here in just a second. <laughs> I will tell you, I have been to Disneyland twice in my life. Once when I was seven, and then once a, few, a number of years ago when my kids were a little bit younger, um, I had to go. They were, and when I was seven, about halfway into the day, um, me and my sisters looked at mom and dad and said, this is boring, can we go to Six Flags? 
Um, so I obviously was not a big Disney fan growing up. Well, then my took, well, we took our kids. And then this past year, my wife and uh, daughter and son were going down. Mackenzie was going to look at a college in California. And they were going to be close enough to Disney, and so they were going to go to Disneyland. Well, I told my wife that I knew for sure that she loved me because she didn't make me go to Disneyland with them. Yes, I'm not a big fan of Disney. Why do I say this? Why do I put this picture up? Because if you go to Disneyland early in the morning, oh, it is the happiest place. The kids are so excited. They're running around. They're bouncing off the wall. I mean, it's just they're so happy to be at Disneyland. But about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they start to look like that. It's not so happy. You know what Disneyland, Disney figured out? Was that they could sell happiness and joy as a commodity. That is why Disney has made billions and billions and billions of dollars. It's because they got people to believe that you could buy happiness like you can buy bread in the store. They got us to believe it. But we know that only Jesus can bring real joy. And it is a joy that is found deep inside. It's not a joy that's on the surface. It's a joy that goes beyond whatever may be happening around you. But only Jesus can bring that. And that joy comes from a profound, a spiritual, and intimate relationship with Him. It doesn't come from anything else. It doesn't come from going to Disneyland. You might have a great time. You might be one that Disneyland is just the funnest place. And that's great. But you're not going to get true joy by going to Disneyland. True joy is only going to come through knowing Jesus Christ. And not knowing Him on the surface. Because I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of people that know Jesus on the surface. I've often said that, that here in, in the Bible Belt, we have become inoculated to Christianity. What do I mean by that? We have gotten just enough Christianity so that when the real thing comes around, we say, oh no, I've already got it. We need more than that. Because too often, what we do is we play with the cardboard box when the greatest gift ever given is knocking at the door saying, let me come in. I want to challenge you to quit, quit playing with the cardboard box. The shepherds encountered that joy as they searched for the baby. You know what's interesting when I read that story? It's interesting something that's not in there. And maybe it's not in there just because Luke didn't want to waste time writing about it. But it's always intrigued me that it does not tell us what they did with the sheep. And there's a part of me that has always wondered, did they, when it happened, when, they, when the night explodes, and they see the angels, and you know, after, they're ter- after they get through being terrified, and they go, the good news of great joy, and they, that they look at each other, I'm sure their first reaction is they look at each other, and they're thinking, was that a dream? Did I just have some kind of weird dream? And they look, and they can tell by the looks on the faces of the other shepherds that are there, that no, it was not a weird dream, because if it was, they all had the same weird dream. And if they then began to look at each other and go, Okay, it wasn't a dream. It was real. I've always wondered, did they just jump up and just hightail it and, and get into town and find the baby Jesus and look at each other and go, ooh, who stayed with the sheep? I have often wondered, because I hope that would have been my reaction. I hope my reaction would have been when that happened that I would have left everything and run to find the baby, to find the Messiah that I would have dropped everything and not worried about anything else to be able to go find the Messiah. And then it says that after they left, that they told everybody they saw. I mean, it gives the idea that they were walking down the street stopping people. Do you know the Messiah has been born? Do you know the Messiah is here? Do you know the Messiah? I mean, just so excited. The joy that they experienced overtook their life. And yet we play with cardboard boxes. And we play with cardboard boxes. And we play with cardboard boxes. Folks, quit playing with 
cardboard box. Get your life focused on Christ. If you get your commitment connection card, the first one under I commit to is I will find joy in Jesus, not presence. I want to challenge you. Can you to find your joy not in the presence? Don't put your hope for a great Christmas in having the best presence. Put your hope for the great Christmas in the birth of Jesus and celebrating it. And then the second one, I will attend the Christmas Sanger Christmas Parade and help. Okay, you notice I didn't just say I will attend the Sanger Christmas Parade. I want you to come and enjoy it. But I want you to commit to coming and helping. Come and be a part of it. And then we're going to do something at the end of that. I, I'm sure that our Parks and Rec Department has this plan for cleaning up and picking up trash in the park when it's done. They probably do. But I want to blow them away. I'm going to ask us, when we finish and the parade is done, I'm going to just ask us, First Baptist, when it's done, to walk around and pick up all the trash. Not so that anybody will look and say, oh, wow, what are they doing? But I want us to serve. We're going to serve by handing out hot chocolate. And there's a po pretty good possibility that some of those hot chocolate cups are not going to end up in a trash can. And I don't want the City of Sanger staff to have to go back and pick up those cups. And so I'm going to just challenge us. Once we're done finishing, we finished handing out the hot chocolate to just come around and pick up the trash that's in the park. Let's leave it spotless. Let's give a gift, not just to the people of Sanger, but let's give a gift to the city of Sanger. Come out on Christmas. Come out on Thanksgiving, that parade. And get over the commercialism. Quit playing with a cardboard box and focus on Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, I pray today, Lord, that...